welcome to the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHC-TV candidate debate for the Board of Education in West Hartford, Connecticut. We are pleased to bring you this nonpartisan voter service in cooperation with West Hartford Community Television. This debate and others for the council will be shown numerous times on WHC-TV in the weeks preceding the November 7th election. It will also be available for streaming through the station's YouTube channel. We thank the campaigns for their cooperation. I am Carol Mulready. I'm a member of the League of Women uh, Voters of Greater Hartford and will serve as the moderator of this debate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which works to encourage informed and active participation in government. And we hope that this debate will serve as one piece of information that assists you as you prepare to vote. The debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format, which is designed to enable the candidates to freely elaborate on their approaches to a variety of issues, unimpeded by the strict time constraints of other debate formats. Each candidate will have a total of eight minutes to answer questions in this format. During the time of the debate, they will also receive information from timers who are here from the League of Women Voters uh, that inform them how much time they have left. After each candidate has had a chance to respond to a question, candidates are encouraged to rebut or sir rebut so that the differences in their understanding of questions can be expressed to the voters. And they understand that the clock is running during that time. At the end of the debate, we will have two minutes for each candidate to give a closing statement. And this was determined previously by lottery. It is now my pleasure to introduce the candidates who have committed their time and energies to this important aspect of the democratic process running for elective office. So first, we have Lorna Thomas Farquharson. Lorna has been a proud member of the West Hartford community for over 17 years. She is a mental health therapist and community outreach educator, speaking on various topics such as effective communication, self-esteem, workplace etiquette, um, vicarious trauma, and crisis management. Lorna received a BA in psychology from Spelman College and master's and doctorate degrees in clinical psychology from the University of Hartford. Lorna is married to Jerome and they just celebrated their 11th wedding anniversary. They have two daughters, Juliana and Gabrielle, both of whom are students at Charter Oak International Academy. Professionally, Lorna strives to empower others to address challenges and improve their quality of life. Personally, she is passionate about education promoting the development of well-rounded youth, where excellence is defined by thriving academically, socially, and emotionally, and where the values of learning extend beyond the walls of a classroom. Welcome, Lorna. Next, we have Robert Levine. He is a member of the Republican Party and an endorsed candidate for the Board of Education in West Hartford. His wife, Gail, has been a teacher in town for 17 years, and he has been a small business owner of Hart Real Estate for seven years with an office in West Hartford Center. He has three school-aged children, Jack, Cam, and Katie, with two dogs, Benji and Jedi. As just mentioned, he has been a small business owner for seven years while working as a realtor in total for over 12 years. He is currently serving as the vice president on the board of directors for the Greater Hartford Association of Realtors. He also serves on the West Hartford Board of Assessment Appeals. His background in government goes back many years, from his small fall semester of college as a White House intern in Washington, D.C., to his first job after graduate school as a policy analyst on the Speaker's Task Force on Education in New York State. After a time, he became a budget analyst on the Ways and Means Committee. Robert also has done consulting jobs doing program evaluation and financial audits for public housing authorities and child support enforcement agencies around the country. 
Robert's educational background includes an undergraduate degree in political science from the University of Massachusetts and a master's degree in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Robert. Next, we have Deb Polin. She and her husband, Ian, moved to West Hartford in 1999. Their children, Jordan and Megan, attended Aiken Elementary, King Philip Middle, and Hall High School. Jordan is now a sophomore at the University of Albany, and Megan is a junior at Hall. Deb has almost 20 years of experience in public policy and advocacy. She is currently the Senior Director for Policy and Outreach at the Community Health Center Association of Connecticut helping to ensure that low-income people across Connecticut have access to high-quality health care. Deb is a member of the West Hartford Advisory Commission for Persons with Disabilities, the League of Women Voters, Hall PTO, and the Jewish Community Relations Council. She previously served as president of Congregation B'nai Tikva Salam and as a mentor in the West Hartford Public Schools. Welcome, Deb. And next we have Jay Sarzen, who is running for re-election to the West Hartford Board of Education. Jay has served on the board since December of 2012 and assumed the role of Republican financial ed examiner shortly after he was seated. Jay works at Boston-based IAT? IT. IT group a consulting, advisory, and research firm focused on helping the, the insurance industry strategically navigate through technology-driven changes. Jay's expertise in business has been honed over a career that has largely focused on delivering advice and guidance to Fortune 500 firms, both as an internal associate at, as, at firms such as State Street, Mass Mutual, and The Hartford, and as an external management consultant for Bearing Points, business strategy practice. Jay graduated with honors in political science from Trinity College in Hartford in 1994 and received his MBA in strategy and general management from the University of Notre Dame in 2001. While at Notre Dame, Jay was elected vice president of the MBA program by the classes of 2000 and 2001. Jay and his wife, Amy, a former president of Duffy School PTO, have lived in West Hartford for over 11 years. Their son is a rising sixth grader at Sedgwick Middle School. Welcome, Jay. Cheryl Greenberg has served on the Board of Education since 2015 and is the current board chair. She and her husband, Dan Lloyd, have lived in West Hartford since 1990, and both their daughters have had the good fortune to attend and graduate from the West Hartford Public Schools. Cheryl is the Rather Distinguished Professor of African American History and 20th Century U.S. History at Trinity College, where she has been since 1986. She has also taught and lived in both Finland and China as a Fulbright professor, where the family experienced firsthand some of the best and worst practices of public and international baccalaureate education. Her ongoing commitments to the community reflect her academic interests in race and in social justice movements and her passion for education. While living in West Hartford, Cheryl has served on the boards of the West Hartford Initiative on Racial and Ethnic Dis Diversity, called WIRED, the Greater Hartford Jewish Community Relations Council, the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, the Noah Webster House, the Greater Hartford Jewish Historical Society, and the Connecticut Anti-Defamation League Civil Rights Committee. She has served as a diversity trainer and as a housing discrimination tester for the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. She also teaches a course at Cheshire Correctional Institution and gives talks and leads public discussions across the state on topics related to civil rights, African American and Jewish American history, race relations, and civil liberties. Cheryl sees her work on the Board of Education 
as an extension of these commitments and experiences to make sure our schools are places where the talents of every child are nurtured and his or her needs fully met. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. All right, so it is time for us to begin our questions. And we had a drawing, and our first question goes to Lorna. And everyone can respond as he or she chooses after her response. What is the response that you think would be best considering the decreased state funding of schools? What strategies do you envision to address the possible shortfall in state funding for schools now and in the future? First of all, thank you very much to you and to the League of Women Voters and West Hartford Community Television for having us here today to engage in uh, discussion. Uh, in regard to that question, I think that it's first is important for us to be thoughtful in how we approach the situation that we all are facing in regard to the budget. I say thoughtful because sometimes we can tend to respond uh, reactively versus being proactive and thinking more in the short term versus the long term. I think in regard to our budget, it's important for us to recognize that whatever decisions we make, we must not only think about how they're going to impact our children today, but also how it may impact them in the long run as well. I think if all of us maintain the main priority that quality education is absolutely of the utmost important. I think that will help to guide us to make proper decisions when it comes to our budget. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll jump in. Um, I don't disagree with you. The challenge is that the Democrat caucus refused to sit down with us and really prioritize spending last year. We went through a line item by line item budget and review and we looked at it. Everything was going to be a priority. And unfortunately, that just can't be the case. We all want a quality education for our children, myself included. I've got a sixth grader. But the challenge is that I don't feel that there's been enough attention paid to the prioritization of certain programs. Not everything can be held out as a sacred cow. So with all due respect, I would say that the best way to approach this is to look at things as far as their cost, their impact, and their efficacy. And once you apply those three sound principles to any budget item, that way you can effectively take control over the budget. Because at this point right now, we're not even sure if we're going to be getting funding. We don't even know if we're going to be zeroed out or if we're going to be getting the full $21 million. And I begged and I pleaded with the caucus last year to not play chicken with the state of Connecticut. Uh, that advice, unfortunately, was ignored, and we're in the position right now where we have to answer these questions. Okay. Anyone else? Just to pick on you. Cheryl. Bit. Okay. <laughs> Cheryl. As another member of that uh, group, I would have to say that all of us went very carefully, line by line, and we ended up as a group cutting two, almost three million dollars out of the two budget. million of it was from Tom two Moore. Absolutely, but yeah. I'm just saying at the end, the, right. the, given a roll, a roll forward budget, which is the amount of, of budget if, um, what the cost would be if everything just stayed the same, right, we cut a whole lot, including 16 positions. Where we differed sometimes, and not always on party lines, was which of the programs to cut. But in, in general, actually, we were surprisingly um, in sync in the sense that we all had exactly those questions. And again, we disagreed on certain uh, individual lines, but in fact, I think we all made a very good faith effort to cut. What we didn't know was we didn't want to cut more than we needed to. We certainly didn't want to be irresponsible and not cut at all. So mm -hmm. I agree, we're, we may be headed for a much different era well, this time. Remember we had an opportunity to excise $4 million from the budget. $4 million in teacher salary increases that I asked the WHEA to reopen the contract for possible negotiation. It was a contract that I supported. Mm -hmm. It was a contract that I voted for, and you know that. Absolutely. And I asked them, please, th these are funds that we can reinstate at a moment's notice. And there was no appetite from your caucus to try to apply any pressure whatsoever on the teachers' union. So there is a big difference, Cheryl, unfortunately. I, I don't doubt your good intentions, but that's the bottom line. There was $4 million that we could have saved, theoretically, now, I understand that it truly wasn't upon you to decide whether or not, but still, there was no pressure applied. And I felt that 
would have made a great statement had the Democratic caucus come forward and said, hey, teachers, we need to pony up here. Okay, does anyone else want to uh, take this on? I'll say we're, we're brief, you know, uh, I, I do think that's why we need some new folks on the board because um, I think we can make general statements about like, well, you know, we gotta make sure that we take care of the kids and just having three school-aged children in the system, I'll echo Jay's comment, like I, I care very much and very deeply. My wife's a teacher. I, I feel like I have a really good understanding of what's happening on the ground and the front lines. Um, but you really have to be judicious in, in what's going on. And, I think everybody knew that the state was in serious trouble, that the town councilors promised us uh, that they were going to protect us, and now we're looking at zero dollars. So we have to go forward with a different mindset of really looking at the costs and the benefits of every program. And I personally feel that we need to, at all costs, save programs for the children and look at administrative fat where we can cut things back. And while it may not be initially millions of dollars in savings, when you start to add it up, it could become that. And I think that that hasn't been done in the past where things have just kind of been looked at. And it's like, well, yeah, we'll, we'll lay off 16 positions, but, you know, management goes untouched or, you know, we're, we're going to cut back uh, an after school program or we're going to increase class sizes. But, you know, we'll, we'll we'll just keep it status quo. The status quo isn't working anymore. We really have to come at it with some new ideas and some and some new tactics so that as this continues, but this is really just the cusp of what's going on with the state. If we think this year is bad, year or two years from now, it's only going to be worse. We can't continue to do the status quo. You know, Rob, I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of administrative savings. You know, as well as some of our viewers know, that West Hartford has already found administrative savings by consolidating some backroom functions and continuing to uphold high quality and outcomes. Now our town ranks 128th in the state in per pupil spending while still maintaining our nationally ranked schools deservedly. So continuing to seek efficiencies is definitely worthwhile. It's something that we should continue to do without compromising our students' education. But it's important for people to understand that those efficiencies have already begun, and West Hartford has really been a model community in that way. I would also just add, again, that the people that we cut were, in fact, administration. Um, we did not let teachers go except for um, those classes that, that shrunk. Um, they were, in fact, all the cut, almost all the cuts, in fact, were from administrative and other staff, so. But you're absolutely right, it's gonna be worse before it gets better. More needs to be done. Well, since we're talking about money and things <coughs> that could get worse, certainly the uh, commitment that the school system has made, as well as the town over the years for um, uh, pensions, um, compensation for teachers, the, the health plans for retirement and so on. What can be addressed with pensions, compensation, um, retirement plans in your estimation? Well, pension specific, specific kinds of things, okay? Sure. Pensions really, until the governor has his way, really are not, for at least for teachers anyway, are not really that much of a burden on the town of West Hartford. So until the governor decides that we're all taking about one third over, I don't think it's really anything that dramatic we have to worry about. What we do have to worry about, however, is health care. And everybody who has looked at this budget knows full well that one of the biggest items that we cannot control is our health care spending. So that teacher contract that I referred to earlier, where we got the teachers to agree to go on to a high deductible health plan, which is primarily why I voted for it, because I thought that was tremendous of them to agree to that. Um, the, 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 and the devil's in the details, however, in that the deductible is not that high, and we are still funding 50% of the deductible. So uh, over time, we can't do it now, but over time, we're going to have to eventually move our teachers into a plan that has a little bit of a higher deductible, and we're going to have to ask them to uh, not have their 50% deductible taken care of. It's got to have to be at a lower level. The town simply can't afford it because our health care costs are so variable. Um, and I can share with you that, you know, most of the drivers of that are a few individuals who have had some catastrophic health emergency, like open heart surgery or, or something like that. And there's really nothing we can do about that on a year to year basis. So the steps that we can take on the health care, uh, number one, raise our deductible at the next teacher's contract. Number two, reduce the amount of deductible uh, that we're funding as a town. And probably number three, try and extract a little bit more concessions as far as their uh, premium contribution going forward. Okay. So, here we go. Somebody want to 
I would just like to say I, I respectfully receive what you're sharing. I think it's important for us to be mindful that whatever deductions or anything when it comes to our teachers, that the quality education that we have is because of the quality teaching staff that we have. And the better we treat our teachers, the better the teachers will teach our children. So those factors need to be considered when it comes to uh, the discussions that we're having right now. I'm married to a teacher, so I mean, Jay's suggestions actually really impact me. And uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, thanks a lot, Jay. Um, so we experienced firsthand in our household uh, the exact things that you, you know the contract changed, and uh, it's tough. Uh, the reality is, though, that the the states, like I said earlier, going broke. That the town is going to have to have more responsibility, and people have to realize that we're no longer in an environment where we continue to pay as a town, the things that we've done in the past. It, it certainly is a hardship for teachers, and I agree with you, Lauren, like we gotta take care of them. I want my wife to be happy. <laughs> um, but you know, at the same time, we have to make sure that the town can take care of the fiscal responsibilities it has to. And so these are areas that we have to unfortunately look at. Um, but going forward, that's what we're gonna have to do. As we continue to worry about financial commitments that are there and the quality of education, other topics are going to come up, and one of them is uh, th that have financial implications and also have educational implications. I'd like to have you discuss um, your opinion regarding charter schools, and let's start with Deb. You know, I'm not satisfied that the charter schools that we have here in Connecticut have demonstrated accountability and transparency in what they do with public funds. I think our schools in West Hartford are fantastic. I'm proud to be the mother of two West Hartford public school children. And the reason I'm running for the board is because I believe so strongly in continuing the successes of our schools. The charter school movement has um, been stronger in some other states than in Connecticut, but the charter schools that we have had have demonstrated that they don't have similar hiring standards for teachers, mm -hmm. nor do they have similar standards for admitting students nor retaining students. So I do not believe that public money should be going into schools that do not have the same standards, transparency, and accountability as public schools. Okay. And Rob, how about you? You have a wife as a teacher. What do you think about the charter school movement? Well, if I want dinner when I go home, the answer is pretty easy. Um, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, I can echo some of Deb's comments. Uh, I'm a, a big supporter of the public school system. I think that public uh, dollars, our tax dollars, need to go to the public schools. Um, they have a proven track record in this town. Uh, we have an excellent school system in place. The, the last thing I want to see happen is money being taken away to, to go to a charter school system um, that might not be doing the same types of things that it should be doing here in West Hartford. And, and keep my charter schools go back a long time. Um, I actually studied that subject when I was working for the speaker in uh, Albany 20 some years ago. So that it's, it's not a new thing, and I think there are models that can work. Um, and I don't think we should ever completely close the door to a successful model. But again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The town's doing a great job. Let's fully fund the town education system. And I, I would be opposed to someone coming in and saying, well, we, you know, we want to open uh, a charter school and take some of that money away. If they want to privately fund it, well, that's a different conversation. But public funds should be for the public school system. OK. Mm -hmm. Okay, so continuing with these alternate kinds of situations, one of the items for challenging public education over the years has been vouchers. What, and, and Rob mentioned private schools, that money should go to public schools, and vouchers will allow payment to private schools. So Cheryl, let's start with you, and what can you tell us about your opinion of the vouchers that some um, people in uh, leadership positions would like to see happen in this country and in the state? I'm sure they would, uh, but this is actually, for me, a very easy question. Um, we have a public school system that is fully funded and its commitment is to educate all children. Anyone has the right to withdraw their child, put them in a religious school, in a private school, to homeschool them. That is completely up to the parent. But it's not up to the school, uh, to the state, I'm sorry, or the town, uh, to fund alternative education opportunities. We have an education system. Everyone can come. And I think uh, that's our commitment is to public education, to civic education, not necessarily to advance the agendas of private and parochial schools. I think also there's an issue of church and state, 
to the extent that these, these schools are religious, we can't use state money. Uh, and second of all, I think there's selectivity issues. If you go to a private school, their, sco their scores are going to be higher, well, sure, because the people that they're selecting are going to be doing better. There's not the same kind of accountability of accessibility, uh, things like that. So as long as we have a public school system that's committed to educating all of our children, that's where the money should go. If you want to spend private money, by all means, but I'm not for vouchers. Okay, how about you, Jay? Um, I choose to withhold, to reserve my time for a topic that's more relevant to West Hartford. Okay, anyone else have a little word to say about vouchers? Not a thing. Oh, interesting. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, another um, question that the League discussed um, when we were putting all of our questions together, again, has some impact on what budgeting is all about. What is your opinion on play, pay to play <laughs> in sports, arts, any aspect of extracurricular activity in our schools? I don't like it. Uh, I fought against it. We, as a board, had reduced the fee for pay to play, and unfortunately, we had to put some of it back, and, and that's understandable. Unfortunately, given the budget constraints of where we are, um, that falls low on the priority list. So, you know, I understand that we need to have it. Uh, I wish we didn't, though. Anyone else? I think it all goes to affordability, you know? I mean, the, the, the pay-to-play thing is, I, I think, the cost has doubled in the last uh, seven, eight years. And um, I know everyone wants to keep West Hartford affordable. That's what you hear from, from everyone. And this is an area that really affects families' bottom line. So this is a focus that hopefully we can keep in line in years to come. You know, look, nobody likes pay-to-play. Um, but I think that when we talk about the balance between providing activities and um, taxpayer dollars. I think that uh, across the state, many towns have moved to a pay-to-play system, including uh, fee waivers for families that are in need so that people can continue to participate in these extracurricular activities. But there is only one town in the state that's higher than ours, and that's Tolland. So I guess we'd be happy we're not Tolland. <laughs> okay, very good. Anyone else? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another topic that is constantly in the news these days is um, the issue of bullying and cyberbullying. Is the school system prepared to address this in all ways that are necessary through its policies and practices? And are those practices, policies and practices, the practices, are the practices consistent across the system? I can start if okay, you'd like. Cheryl. Um, because we've addressed exactly these issues. And the answer is, it is never enough. There's, you are never going to have a system that's going to cover all the contingencies. Um, but I have been impressed, actually, with what West Hartford has in place, um, which is a system um, that is really all-encompassing. It includes on-campus, it includes off-campus, it includes um, private bullying, it includes online bullying, and it also has a list of access points for students to choose so that if a student doesn't feel comfortable going to a teacher or a student doesn't feel comfortable going to the principal, that there are a variety of people that they can turn to. Is it enough? Of course not. Children are bullies sometimes, and sometimes we don't know what's happening until we really see the, the outcome. So I'm not sure that there's ever enough that you can do, but I've been very moved by how committed uh, the administration has been in terms of trying to deal with the issue, the issue as much as they can, both in, in school and outside of school. If I may add, I think I agree with what has been shared. I think it's quite clear that our school system has a no tolerance in regard to bullying. But I think it's important for us to respond to it, not only from a reactive standpoint, meaning that when a young person has reported being bullied, but also to be proactive. Uh, when we work on our children in terms of their self-esteem, in terms of their confidence, in terms of their social skills, when you're able to boost those pieces up, you're likely going to decrease the incidences of bullying. Bullying happens for a reason. Uh, whatever that reason is, that is something we do have to explore more of, but it happens for a particular reason. And that's why I think it's important for us to be, yes, certainly vigilant in responding to it, but also proactive in dealing with the needs of our children and building up their sense of self so they don't feel the need they have to bully. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, 
One of the uh, other topics that was of interest to the League is observing our town over the last many years and its demographics changing quite considerably. So the question that uh, we have put together is, are we effectively meeting the needs of the changing demographics in the town? And can you give any instances of how that is demonstrated? If I may. You certainly I may. I think that it's, the town is recognizing and it also recognizes that there's more we can be doing. I think if we ever get to a place of feeling as though we've done all that needs to be done in addressing the changing demographics, well, that, that we're setting the bar too low. Uh, we certainly know how diverse our town is, not only ethnically, but culturally and economically as well. We have over 70 languages that are spoken in this town and that's what makes it as vibrant and wonderful as it is and we know the learning must continue and needs to continue. So I think the conversation needs to continue to happen. When we have more open lines of communication and dialogue about the different differences we have, that will minimize certain stereotypes or certain uh, judgment calls that are made. I also think it's important for our school systems, as we do, to respond if they notice that there are some concerns or challenges that they see in their school or in their community regarding the different uh, demographics that we have. I can share that um, I have heard of times where certain not so nice things were said about certain students simply because of the color of their skin. Those, that's a reality. That's a reality that our town faces and all towns face. And I think that it would not be in our best interest to put a blind eye and pretend it doesn't happen here. It happens here. But I think what's important is to know that we don't tolerate that and we respond to it and we recognize all of our differences as something that makes our town as wonderful as it is. Okay. I think West Hartford is known as a, as, a, as a rather diverse, tolerant community. Um, Someone once told me, or I heard somewhere, that you know it's it's kind of a microcosm of the world as we know it. To your point, with all the different languages spoken, and to give you a specific example, uh, one of the things I'm really uh, amazed by is the unified uh, arts and sports programs in this town, um, bringing people together of different abilities, so they not only everyone benefits, they all participate, they they all get a positive thing out of the outcomes, and that was something started by a student here many years ago and has grown. Uh, exponentially across the state and the nation, and you know that's something which Harper should be proud of. Uh, if I can yep. just add, uh, and this goes back to Lorna's point about being proactive. Um, another thing that the board has been very strong about, and that the the um, administration has absolutely embraced, is taking diversity seriously. Not just in terms of don't use those words or don't call people things, but tr really trying to rethink the entire curriculum to embed diversity in all its forms into every aspect of the curriculum so that children see themselves, so children see different kinds of people in everything that they study, in the teachers that are in front of them, in the administration, in every part that they, can, that they, uh, that they are experiencing. And so again, there's always more to do, and I, and I agree, but to the extent that students can have that as a norm as opposed to an external added piece, I think it's a really wonderful thing, and I really commend the administration on how hard they've worked on that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Um, thank you for those thoughtful responses um, on <coughs> excuse me, all of those cases. Um, I would like you to address um, the best way to um, take into account the increase in incivility in our society and our schools. And um, Jay, why don't you start? Well, I think incivility goes <clears throat> a lot of different ways. I, I've heard stories, as Lorna just shared, uh, I've heard stories of people with Republican viewpoints being excoriated as well. Uh, I think that we are at a point in society where people feel empowered to um, be mean to one another because you can do so over Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever people are using these days to communicate their feelings. And everyone's a hero behind a keyboard. Um, I think if people were forced to go face to face with people, um, there would be a lot of different outcomes. So I would say that incivility can really be eliminated by getting people to actually speak face to face with one another. 
You know, I have a, a strong passion for promoting civic engagement, and I would like to have our schools really teach the students and their families and the greater community productive ways of participating in democracy mm -hmm. uh, at the local level, the state level, and the national level. And that would include a conversation around appropriate um, speaking tones, um, civility, um, doing your research, how to tell your story to, to make an impact, which I think could really help West Hartford make its case at the state level for, uh, for additional funding. And um, I really believe that promoting civic engagement on all levels of our schools can help our students learn how to interact with each other and have them learn to trust our government and learn to participate in our government. Okay. I can just add one sentence. I have to say that I also think the schools are critical because they are the front line of that kind of activity that it is in classrooms where teachers can maintain civility and rational discourse and polite argumentation and discussion. Uh, and I think that's why schools are more important now than ever, is to model exactly those behaviors. Are there any um, curriculums or programs that you know of that would help in that regard to help our schools to um, demonstrate, as Deb was saying, that people need to talk together. I mean, what, what strategies can be used bringing them together? Do you have any specific ideas? I think lead by example. Uh, mm -hmm. We certainly could find a curriculum and teachers could follow it and read through it and check things off, but if teachers or community providers are not themselves embodying the skill sets that we want our young people to practice, well, then it's a bunch of phony baloney, and kids will call you out if they think you are not being sincere. So I think it's very important that the role that we play as adults, we must model and role model for young people how to be civil, how to treat one another, how to communicate effectively, and, and how to be assertive if they feel as though they have something or they see something that's not being done right. So I think all of us can play a role, a leadership role, in helping to provide or create that curriculum. Okay. I, I think in general kids today are, are a little bit different than kids back then and, and um, Cheryl was my history professor at Trinity and back yes back long not that long ago. I gave him an A. <laughs> <laughs> but back then people were not afraid to engage one another. <clears throat> Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, communists, capitalists, everyone was okay engaging one another and somehow <clears throat> somewhere along the line it became so bifurcated that we can't get people with opposing viewpoints or opposing uh, philosophies to sit together in one room. I mean, look, I mean, I may not agree with everything that people to my, my left are saying, but that doesn't mean that they're good people, and it doesn't mean that they've got valid points of view. I just may not happen to agree with them, and that's okay. That's what makes this country fun and interesting. So everybody should watch the League of Women Voters debates, and then <laughs> they will learn civility. <laughs> Good point. I, I'll say this too, though. You know, I mean, uh, I think our teachers are already doing this uh, since I'm married to one. And uh, so I'm kind of loath to say let, let's put like a new uh, mandate on them when I think by and large we have an amazing teaching staff that's doing this kind of thing. I think we as, as adults in, in the home, as parents, um, share the, the lion's share of the responsibility to try and raise good citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know it's a hard job they have to work at every day, but I think our teachers are already there. If I may piggyback, I think that's a, a good point, yes. And when it comes to teaching our young people, it's important for us to know that we all are part of a village. Many have heard me say, I believe it takes a village to raise a child. And that village extends beyond the classroom. So whether you are at the corner store, whether you're at the gas station, or whether you're just walking down the street, everyone plays a role in helping to cultivate a learning environment to help a young person learn how to learn and live and interact with other people. So all of us play a role in helping our children to learn and become educated. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I, th I think you had some very thoughtful things to say, all of you. Um, one more question on um, what West Hartford has been trying to do over the years in narrowing the achievement gap that is so-called in um, education among students that it, it can be from any variety of reasons. Their cultural differences, their race, it could be their economic situation. It is not just one area that causes that gap. So I'd like you to try to address that for us. And um, Cheryl, why don't you start? Um, well, there are two kinds of uh, gaps. The state identifies a gap 
that uh, is English language learners, economically disadvantaged children, and students with disabilities. Uh, and the gaps are substantial between them and the non-special needs students. There's a second layer of uh, difference which we've asked for information about on the board, which is by race. And there again, the differences between uh, African American and white, Hispanic and white, are really quite striking. Uh, it has in fact narrowed in recent years, I think in part thanks to the kinds of curricular changes that we've been talking about and the kinds of efforts we've been talking about. Uh, and it is half of what the, sta the state gaps are in, both, in, in all of those categories. So I do think West Hartford is doing a great job trying to do things. It is improving, but it will never be enough until we have no gaps at all. Okay. Right here. Gentlemen. Well, I, I think, you know, what, what, you know, what, what Cheryl has said is true. I, I think one of the uh, elements that I look to to help reduce this achievement gap is our ESOL. We want to make sure that we've got a strong ESOL program. Uh, I said it during my two-minute campaign infomercial that if we have a good, strong ESOL program, that can eliminate a lot, not all, but a lot of the issues that emerge downstream. Uh, the grasp of English really can hold someone back, and if we don't have that kind of a strong program in place, we're going to be dealing with a lot of issues that are going to be more expensive and more challenging to deal with. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, I think this you. really goes to educational equity, and our town has demonstrated a commitment to narrowing the achievement gap, but until it's completely eliminated for people who have a variety of different needs, whether it's special ed or, or economic diversity or race um, or any or English language learners, uh, until that gap is eliminated, it's not enough. And so we need to make sure that we are working with the educators in town to ensure all students have the opportunities, the support, and the tools that they need. And the tools that they need might vary by student, but the goal is to get everybody to the same place. So we need to think about people as whole people. Uh, it may take some personalized attention, uh, which I think our teachers have demonstrated a high aptitude for in our classrooms. It's amazing to see, I mean, just go into a kindergarten classroom someday, and you've got some kids who are reading and some kids who don't know their letters yet. And to see how a kindergarten teacher can handle a room full of kids at a wide variety of abilities, it's, it's just amazing. And I know that our teachers across every level of education in our town are trying to meet all of the needs of our students and we need to give them the tools that they need so that our students can achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just say one last yes, piece absolutely. That I with all that has been shared. I think with us certainly recognizing we must remember that children have potential. I think if we lose sight of that, then we're, we're going down a slippery slope. I think we must remember that children do have a potential to learn, and there may be times that a little bit more work is required to do so. But as long as we know that the work will produce benefits in the long run, then we're heading, headed in the right direction. Okay. Excellent. I have one last question that I'd like each of you to answer. What do you think is the strongest trait you would bring to the policy-making function of the Board of Education? So think about that for a second. Would look You're at me. <laughs> Put I mean, you I, on I, the spot I'll start. here. I'm on the end here. I'm the redheaded stepchild of the group. I, uh, you know, I, I think personally, I just I have a long history, uh, as you mentioned in my bio. Um, with a, a degree, a master's of public policy and management, and I, I focused on education quite a bit, and then I had a job that that was my specific focus for, uh, for some time. And then, you know, I, I, like I've said before, uh, like you said before, it's been uh, just kind of throughout my entire career, it, it's always been there where it's been a passion. Um, I've worked on budgeting, uh, program evaluation to really get at the, you know, the, the efficiency and effectiveness of each and every program as it works. So I think that's a strength that I would bring to the board is really, um, I like to say, shine a flashlight um, on program by program and, and uh, really wanting to like roll up my sleeves and work with those people and not just on the budget side of things, but on the program side of things and say like, you know, how is this running? How is it working? What can we possibly do to improve it? And then let's develop a plan to work to that end. I've done it my whole life uh, when I worked for government and consulting firms. I still do it uh, with my own business. To, you know, when I help people buy houses. It's really what I'm all about. And so that's the strength that I'll, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a doer. I look at things, I roll up my sleeves, I want to get it done, figure out the best way that we can spend our money 
to get the most uh, benefit for the education programs for our kids. And that's what I plan to do if I'm lucky enough to get on. All right. Deb, why don't you go next? Sure. Um, like Rob, I also have a public policy background. And having worked in government and in a nonprofit, I feel I have the skill set, the expertise, and the creative thinking skills to look at the programs that we're providing here in West Hartford and see if um, there might be more efficient, more creative partnerships that might be able to be developed to maintain those programs for our students. Um, I'm a reasonable person. I like to hear what people are thinking. I like to take in. Um, I want to hear what the residents of our town think are the priorities in our town and try to work to build consensus and see where we can find um, efficiencies and ways of moving our schools in the proper direction. Okay. Cheryl, why don't you go next? Uh, sure. Uh, I would say, first of all, they think all of us are passionate about education because we certainly would not be doing this job um, for free uh, <laughs> any other way. Um, but I would say that my particular strength is that I am a teacher through and through. I have taught high school, I've taught college, I've taught um, in different countries, I've taught uh, prisoners, uh, and I'm really, really, I think all the time about how, to, how kids learn and how to encourage them to learn and think critically, uh, and I am in, in, enmeshed in those kinds of questions, and I've spent my whole life working on diversity issues, on equity issues, and so I really bring those two passions, I think, um, to the work on the board. Jay? Uh, I'm results oriented. My focus is strictly on <clears throat> good outcomes. So when I consistently ask the central administration to see where our kids are going off to college, do they get into their first choice schools, do they get into their second choice schools, it's not because I'm interested in just knowing, it's because I want to make sure that our kids are set up for success in the view that they want to be. Um, Results oriented, I think I can point to the one policy that I'm most proud of, which is our uh, school mascot policy. Um, we were a very divided board that year. Um, there was a lot of community discussion going on, and I reached across the aisle to my colleagues and said, listen, guys, let's think through a good solution that's going to take into account everyone's point of view. There were those who felt that the mascots were insensitive. There were those who wanted to maintain tradition. We worked very hard to find a solution that was workable for both sides, and I think that we've reached a good outcome. So that's what I'm bringing to the table. Results oriented, regardless of party, I want good outcomes. Thank you. And our first question, we had this, Lorna, for you, and now you're the last on the last question. So you. what's your best trait, your, your strongest trait that you bring to the policymaking board? My strongest trait is that, as I share with many people, I like to keep it real. And what I mean by that is I am passionate about our young people, I'm passionate about our school system, and I have no reason to be dishonest. There may be a time when I may say something that may rub someone the wrong way, you may not like, but it's important to know that it comes from a good place. I am a mother, I'm a community provider. Over the years, I have gone into homes and provided services in the home, so I see the outcome of the different policy pieces that are put into place. I'm actively involved with my children's school and the PTO board and volunteering and spending time with the teachers, so I see the outcome in many different facets. So it's a matter of being a part of the team to want to be a part of the decisions that are made, because I've seen how those decisions play out in our schools and in our community. And I think my main piece that I bring to the table, again, is keeping it real, but definitely with it coming from a good place of wanting what's good for my children and wanting what's good for all of our children. Well, thank you. I think that was a very nice picture of um, a lot of internal passion on all of your parts. <laughs> so I, I hope we haven't stolen the thunder for the closing statements um, that you have prepared for us. But um, I enjoyed that set of answers very much. Good. Thank you. So it is now time for our, our uh, timers to reset their clocks. Each person has two minutes for a closing statement and uh, we will start as um, we found from our lottery with Rob Levine. You get to go first for a closing statement. Thanks, Karen. Um, why am I running? Um, my wife asked me that question before I decided to do this. And uh, the, the main reason was I, I, I feel like we've reached a point of status quo in this community. Uh, we, have, we have great teachers, we have a great school system, um, 
but I'm worried that we're on the, on the precipice of going down. And a lot of that has to do with what's going on at the state level, but uh, it also trickles down to the local level with our town councilors and our people that represent us on the Board of Education. And I thought, instead of sitting around the table anymore and complaining at dinner time, um, I'm going to step up and try and make a difference. Uh, it's what I've tried to do my whole life. I'm very passionate about uh, speaking up and standing up. And like I said earlier, uh, I'm very invested in the schools because, uh, as I said, my wife's been a teacher for 17 years, so not only do I get first-hand information from her, uh, but also, uh, fortunately, I've become friends with many of her colleagues. So I am, in, in a sense, uh, in the weeds on the front line, knowing what our, our dynamic teachers are doing. And with my three school-age children in the classrooms, too. Um, no one will be more committed to making sure that we do the best we can for our kids. Uh, as I said before, too, I, I've got a proven background of managing budgets and getting things done. Um, I want to ensure that West Hartford continues down that path where people want to move to our town for the education system and feel that they are getting a great bang for their buck. Um, the money needs to go to constantly improving the kids' outcomes. And uh, I plan that you know, everything needs to have a flashlight si uh, shine on it so that we know if there's anything out there that we can divert funds to, to better those outcomes, or to change programs that we're getting better results, that's where I'm going to be. Uh, just like Jay said earlier, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, it's all about the kids, and that's what I plan to do if you're kind enough to vote for me. I'll be the one there every time making sure that that's what getting, is getting done. So thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Rob. And our next closing statement comes from Jay Sarzan. Yes, well, West Hartford, it's been a privilege and an honor to represent you for the past five years in the Board of Education. I'd like another four because I'm very passionate about making sure that our hard-earned tax dollars make their way into the right areas in our educational system. I don't think for one minute that anyone at this table or anyone on the board <clears throat> is going to do anything that would be inimical to the, you know, the, the, the ability of our children to get a great education. I don't believe that for a minute. But there is a way to do it, and there is a way not to do it. And I feel that the approach that I bring to the table that's very results oriented, that's very mindful of uh, fiscal responsibility, will be the way forward. I think that there are plenty of programs in our public schools that could probably use some reorienting, recalibrating, whatever the word you're looking to use, and I would bring that sort of vision into the equation. Now, I don't suppose that it's a stretch to say that I'm an active parent, or my wife and I aren't active parents. Uh, my wife, as I mentioned, in, as was mentioned earlier, was the president of the Duffy PTO. Um, I have gone into the weeds with several student groups uh, in the town, uh, Growing Great Schools approached me uh, back in 2013 to help them get better chicken into the school. So as one of the financial examiners, I sat down with them in Ship Ward and we got that done. Uh, other parents have approached me because they know that I'm an avid squash player to say, hey Jay, is there any way that we can get a squash club going in the middle schools? And of course I've said I will be happy to help, I'll print brochures, whatever needs to be done. It's going to be strictly volunteer, don't worry, no one's paying for it except the parents. But the key is, is that I'm an involved person. Um, I'm not going to do anything that is going to put our children's education or opportunities at risk. I am simply asking this board and you as voters to Think about how much your taxes have gone up over the past several years. Is that sustainable? I don't think that it is, so I'm asking for your vote on November 7th and for a vote for fiscal sanity and responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And next we have Deb Poland. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHC-TV for sponsoring this debate tonight, and my teammates, Cheryl and Lorna, and Rob and Jay as well, for participating in this debate, and all of you for watching at home. My husband Ian and I have lived in West Hartford since 1999. We chose to move here in great part for the quality of its schools, and we have been thrilled with that decision ever since. I've been active in our community, serving as a mentor in our schools, on the board of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford, as president of my synagogue, as a member of the Jewish Community Relations Council, and as a member of the West Hartford Advisory Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Now I'm hoping to serve our community as a member of the Board of Education to help ensure that our schools maintain their well-deserved, high-quality reputation. Some say I picked the wrong time to run for municipal <laughs> office, given the state's 
ongoing budget crisis and the real possibility that West Hartford will see a decrease in state funding over the next several years. But that's why it's so important to have the right people at the table. My 19 years of experience working in the legislature and in a nonprofit means that I'm ready to think creatively about how to maintain critical programs that help make our West Hartford schools as enriching as they are. I'm also prioritizing the integration of health and wellness programs into the school day, as well as promoting civic engagement for our students, their families, and the greater community. My goal is that in three years, in 10 years, and in 20 years, families will still choose West Hartford for its schools. I would appreciate your support on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And next, Cheryl Greenberg. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters and West Hartford uh, Community Television for hosting the debate and, of course, all my fellow panelists. Uh, my husband and I also moved to West Hartford uh, because the town welcomed uh, economic and cultural diversity and because, of course, it had outstanding public schools. And those commitments to education and diversity led me to teach in high school and then college in African American his history, as I said, to teach in China and in Finland and now in a prison. Uh, and to serve as a diversity trainer for schools and civic groups. It also, of course, led me here to the Board of Education, where I'm cu currently serving as chair. With my dedicated colleagues, both Republican and Democrat, uh, we've addressed anti-bullying policies, new state performance standards, curricular innovations, math interventions, embedding diversity, as I said, in all of student learning. We've negotiated employment contracts and protected vulnerable programs. But now the schools face a new challenge, one we've been discussing here, uh, the threat of massive cuts to our education budget. We all struggled last year to trim our already efficient budget without sacrificing the quality of our programs. If I'm reelected, I promise to fight to protect the resources we need to maintain those programs and to help our, support our talented teaching and professional staff while recognizing that, ag uh, that agonizing trade-offs may well ensue. And I will continue to press for greater equity for all students in our diverse community and to intensify our commitment to closing, diver to closing achievement gaps. There's a lot to celebrate about our nationally recognized high-performing schools. West Hartford has been instrumental in setting state and even national standards for education. We've expanded early education and offer programs and services for so many students with individual needs who would otherwise have to be placed out of district. As a teacher of African American history, I'm committed to education, inclusion, and equity. As a taxpayer, I'm committed to rigorous scrutiny of every program and to find creative ways to meet our budgetary or, uh, obligations. And as a parent of two children with very different needs, I'm committed to making sure every child in West Hartford is given the opportunity to thrive. I hope for your support to continue this work, and I urge you to come out and vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, Lorna Thomas Farkason is our final panelist giving her two-minute closing. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, and thank you again to the League of Women Voters and the West Hartford Community Television. Many thanks, uh, rather, West Hartford has been my home for a long time. It is here where I met my husband, and rather where my husband and I are raising our daughters, Juliana and Gabrielle. I was raised in a household where from birth my mother and father instilled in me and my siblings the value of education and the importance in being a good person. It was a requirement that when we went to school, we went to school rather daily, completed our assignments, and always tried to do our best it was an expectation that we treated others as we wanted to be treated, with respect and dignity. I learned early on in life that life is a classroom, therefore learning never ends. I also recognize how valuable lessons learned can take place both in and out of the classroom. As West Hartford residents, we all help to create that classroom environment. We are all a part of the same village, and it takes a village to raise a child. My children are a part of this village. I was a part of a village. So were my parents and my grandparents and so on. Everyone plays a valuable role in helping to provide our youth an opportunity to learn. On one side of my family, I am the fourth generation to receive a college degree. On another side, my grandfather did not complete school beyond the first grade. However, his passion for education and wisdom about life was the driving force that motivated his children to successfully further their education and receive higher ed degrees. West Hartford school system have both received national and statewide rankings over the years. As the mother of two daughters, I'm personally invested in our town, continuing to provide the quality education it is known for. My desire to serve is driven by my passion for education, promoting the development of well-rounded youth who thrive academically, socially, and emotionally. Investing in today's youth is essential as we have the unified responsibility to pave the way for their tomorrow. 
In recognition of today being International Day of the Girl, I ap appreciate how, as a young girl, the values and quality education I received paved the way for me to be here before you today. We must all ensure that our youth continue to receive quality education that soundly paves the way for their tomorrow. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope to have your support on November the 7th. Thank you all. And thank you, voters, for uh, tuning in. I hope you will share the fact that the, this debate will be aired multiple times on WHC-TV. Please share that with friends and neighbors and family. Um, you should also know that West Hartford Life will have the voter's guide for all of the candidates, Board of Education and Council, in the October 27th edition, just before the, edu uh, just before the election. Um, you'll have a week to look it over and review all that you know, need to know. I want to thank our timers who have been here helping us keep this program moving and uh, the candidates informed about how much time they had remaining on their uh, number of minutes. Please remember to get out to vote on November 7th. The municipal election somehow doesn't seem to get the number of people out that it should. That's where your closest contact is with your elected officials and where you can make your dollars matter most. So please remember to share your wisdom in the voting booth on November 7th. And we thank WHC-TV for all it does to promote these programs. Thank you all. Thank you.